Thank you for tuning in to the Way World Outreach Sermon. We believe that God's Word is going to make a major impact in your life. Now let's get ready for this week's Word. All right, before we get into the Word, I want to ask you a question. Okay. About marriage. All right. Okay? All right. Now, if you had to give another key to make a marriage work, what would that key be? Okay, so last time we talked about uh, being in agreement. This time I think would be um, friendship, being friends. And, and the thing is, is that before Marco and I were married, we developed a friendship. And we, um, we were seeing each other for over two years. So we had a lot of time to develop a friendship. And, and I would call him my best friend. That's who I go to to talk to, and he's my, he's my best friend. Yeah, and a best friend's a good word because when you get married, you should marry your best friend. Your girlfriend, girlfriends, should not be your best friends. Your, your, your homies, guys, should not be your best friends. If, if your wife or your spouse that you're getting rid of is not your best friend, wait until you become best friends. And, and you know why some of us can't become friends? We're involved in too much intimacy stuff. Too much feeling up on each other. Let's just break it down. Too much making out before you get married. You don't got time to know the person because you're too busy macking. So, so we got to, that's why me and Lisa made a deal. I, I made a decision to say, honey, I can't be making out with you because I'm not thinking about Jesus. I'm not getting to know you any better. So I, so I made a, I, I, just, I just realized my weakness. Lisa was my kryptonite. When we were single. So I go, honey, I can't even touch you right now. We'll wait until we get married. So we did a deal. I'll hold hands with you. That'd be good. I'll give you a side hug. I'll give you a kiss on the cheek. But that's about it until we get married. And we just kept it like that. And go, let's get to know each other. Let's do ministry to get with, with, with each other. So when we get to that altar, we know each other and we're best friends. Now, being best friends before you get married is easier than staying best friends after you get married. Now, what happens after you get married, you get busy with work, with kids, with this, with the other, that it's so easy, so easy to fall out of friendship and start hanging out or being buddies with people from work or go back to relatives. And I'm not saying don't hang out with your relatives. All I'm saying is this, don't ever put your relatives even your mother and your father, your brothers and your sisters, over your spouse. Make sure no one gets in the way. You guys get that? So, Lisa, um, this is just a pre-study. We're not studying yet. But if, 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 if you were to say, how do you develop friendship after you're married? But, um, yeah. Spending time together. Okay. Spending time doing stuff that you like, stuff that you have in common. Um, okay. So, like, Marco and I... Oh, just a quick FYI. Everybody knows that Marco likes cars and everything. But when I was a little girl, I played with my dolls and my Barbies. But I had Hot Wheels, too. That's why I, I married her. Little, I had the little cars. I would drive them. Yes, I did. So, and um, something that we like that we spend time doing is um, we, like, we like looking at model homes. Or, you know, we like decorating. Um, and also we like looking at cars together and stuff like that. So I think that's good, spending time. Now, now why is it hard to, to spend time with each other after you get married? Because it is, I want you to get this. There's no time. So you got to make time. So that means make time. That means you got 24 hours a day. If you don't make time. When you, you were going out, you used to make time. It was her lunch break, and all of a sudden you'd be driving by right Say, honey, I'm right outside the door. I, don't, I just happen to be driving by. Is it lunchtime? I never would have thought about it. <laughs> yeah, you did. I was all calculated. Right? It's a, but but that, you used to do that intentionally before, before you got married. You made time. You went out of your way. It's going to be the same exact thing. This is a problem if you're not best friends. If you're not best friends, you don't confide your deepest secrets with your spouse. You do have deep secrets, but this is a problem. You'll go to another person instead of going to your spouse, and every time that's happening, you're not developing a deeper, intimate relationship with your spouse. So I'm wondering, who are you going to with your deepest secrets? That's probably your best friend. Right. 
So it's important. I got to open up to Lisa. She has to open up to This is how we get to know each other, okay? Um, also, I would say this about developing friendships. Do this. Focus on what you have in common, not what you don't have in common. Focus on, and if you don't know what you have in common, start now making a list, what we like to do together. We like to laugh together. Ah, or we'll do it. Right? We like to go to Disneyland together. We'll do that. But find out what you like to do together and focus on what you have in common and work from that precept. Okay? Anything else, honey? Nope. Love you guys. All right. There we go. There we go. Love you. Awesome. Awesome. Lisa's going to make sure she don't fall down. We see Miss America fall down once before. Some really embarrassing. No, good. You know, as Lisa is, is, is getting ready to sit down, I would also give you one more advice of developing um, French, friendships or becoming best friends. The number one determiner, the, determiner of a great relationship or a strong relationship is, is, this is what it is, is spirituality. So, so one of the ways that you develop friendship is, this, is, is deciding to explore spiritual terrain together. Like you're doing today, coming to church together. Studying the word together. The most intimate thing you could ever do with your spouse is this. Have a conversation about God. A scripture. That's, that's the strongest determiner of whether you're going to be united and have a strong marriage. Spirituality. So we don't want this. You come five weeks and then we go back to our same ho-hum life. Let's make sure that we invest in our spiritual life. I, w I was yesterday... Um, we were, not yesterday, it might have been yesterday. We were at a furniture store, and I talked to one of the salespeople about God, and then she introduced me to her manager. And you won't believe his name. His name's Jesus. And it's spelled G-E-E-S-U-S -E -S or something like that. Jesus. So, uh, so she introduced me to Jesus. I go, Jesus. I go, do you go to church, Jesus. He goes, no, this, bi this business is my church. That was his answer. I go, I go, Jesus. <laughs> it's funny. I'm witnessing to Jesus. I go, there's a scripture I want to share with you. Maybe you never heard of it. I go, but this is, this is a scripture that would, is going to speak to you right now. And this is what it says. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and then lose his soul? I understand you want to succeed in business, but if, but to sell your soul as a result and at the end have nothing to show for it? Do you understand you're an eternal being? And the soul, the, your soul is the core of who you are. It's going to determine how you do relationships. It's going to determine how you think. It's going to determine your values. And if you're neglecting your soul, do you understand your life is going to fall apart? I told him right there in front of the showroom floor where everybody watching. He goes, wow, I never thought of it that way. I go, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. I want to help you with that. I go, so, look, you got 168 hours a week. Can you just give God two hours to invest in your soul? You probably go to the gym more than two hours in, in a week. You probably do go to work more than two hours in one day. Can you just invest two hours in your spiritual life and make that a staple in your life by saying on the, I'm going to, every week, two hours for God? He goes, man, that's something to think about. Of course, it's your soul. It's the core of your being. You're neglecting that. You're neglecting your relationship. You're neglecting your career. You're neglecting every your health. You're neglecting everything. You're neglecting, of who, neglecting who you're becoming. He goes, I, I, wow, that's interesting. And I'm giving you the same speech. Two hours a week. Make sure after this you continue investing in your soul. How many could do that? Give the Lord a hand if you can do that. Let's all stand up. I'm going to pray real quick and get straight into this word. It's going to be quick. It's going to be good, though. Father, we just thank you for this time to have study your word. Speak to us, Father, because without you speaking to us, Father, it's just a man speaking. We, we're not here to hear a man speak. We're, we're here to he hear you speak. And we just don't want to hear. We want to get revelation. We want to understand it so we can apply it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So today we're going to be talking about creating a happy marriage. So today's teaching, it's here to show us how to create a happy marriage by developing a personal habit of happiness. I just, I just said it. Developing a personal habit of 
of happiness. Now, we, can, we are creatures of habit. The good news is that we could develop good habits. But I think it's easier to develop bad habits. So we've developed habits of anger. We've developed habits of complaining. We've developed habits of even thinking negative thoughts. But have you ever thought about developing a habit of happiness? Now, why is this so important? Because two unhappy people can never have a happy marriage. And one of the biggest problems that we have in marriages today is bad attitudes. And if we don't deal with our attitudes, our marriage, atmosphere, conversations are not going to change. So I'm going to show you four quick steps how to develop a habit of happiness. Number one. Take personal responsibility over your own happiness. Marriage myth. My spouse is going to make me happy. No spouse, no person can make you happy. They can make you feel some happiness, but they cannot make you a happy person. Either you're a happy person or you're not. The good news is if you're depressed, you've been diagnosed with depression, you don't need to stay in depression. There is a way out. You can choose to be diagnosed with some happiness. So in the Bible, this is going to blow your mind, happiness is a command. Now when God gives us a command, what's so awesome about any command that he gives us, he empowers us to actually obey it. So anytime God commands you to do this or don't do that, he says, I'm going to help you. All you got to do is be willing to accept, believe the command, take it on, and I'll help you fulfill it. Look at this scripture. Maybe you've never read it. Real simple scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Look what it says. 1 Thessalonians. Always be happy. Wow, what a great scripture. And, it's, and understand this, that's a command. It's a statement. Always be happy. When are we supposed to be happy? Not once in a while. Not when things are going good. Not when you won the lotto. Right? But you're, the scripture says is that we, I'm going to say this, as believers have an ability to keep joy under all circumstances. So let's keep going on this. Happy it means to rejoice, be glad, be cheerful, be joyful. I believe believers should be joyful. Why would anybody want our God if we're miserable or acting miserable or always angry or always have a bad attitude like everybody else. So I'm going to give you another fact about taking responsibility over our own happiness. This is all I'm saying. It's not your spouse's job to make you happy. You got to learn how to be happy all on your own. Oh, you're not making me happy anymore. I'm out of here. Calm down. No, understand that's your responsibility. Don't put that on me. Well, you're making me angry. No, I'm not making you angry. You're choosing to be angry. You're driving me to drinking. No, 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 no. You want to drink. Don't blame me for your drinking. Okay? You, you, you're responsible for your attitude. I'm going to, another great statement. Your spouse can't always make you happy, but God can. Now, I, I, I want you to get this. There's a joy and a peace and a happiness that you can't get from your job. You can't get from money. You can't get from perfect circumstances. But you could only get this joy from God. Why is it important? Because you could be happy at moments but not be a happy person. Because if your happiness is based on the outside... You're going to be always vulnerable to what's going on, and it will determine how you feel on the inside. But this is what God wants. He wants you to be happy on the inside, and it, and it doesn't matter what's going on the outside, because my happiness is not based on what's going on there. My happiness is based on what God has done here. You guys get this? That's why believers have no excuse, because the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace. He goes, when I'm in you, one of the fruits or results or proof that I'm in you is love and joy. 
Believers should be full of joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It's my strength. And why is that important? Because all of us want to be happy. You are weak. We are weak when we're depressed. We are weak when we're miserable. I'll tell you why we're weak. Because we want to be happy. And there's a problem there. The devil could not negotiate with you. Why can he negotiate with you? You're not happy, right? I got some temporary happiness. Come right here, little boy. I got some candy. I mean, you understand that's how it works. So we're supposed to find our happiness in the Lord. Scripture in Romans 15, 13 says, God gives hope. May he make you very happy. Who am I trusting to make me happy? I'm trusting God to make me happy. And I love my wife, but I can't depend on her to make me happy. The truth is, you know, well, Lisa's not a heavy, like a great, talk, like always talking. I talk more than she does. So when we go on a date. This is how it is right here. Dude, right here. There's not a lot of conversation. So what's up, Lisa? Nothing. Is everything okay? Yeah, it's fine. Why? I so what do you enjoy? I just love being with her. But understand this, I love being with her because I'm already happy. She's already happy. I'm not trying to get her to, to fill me with something I should have got myself. May the Lord make you very happy. I get happy being here today on, on Sunday morning. I get happy serving. I get happy studying the word. I get happy praying for people. I get happy sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. That's where I find my happiness. It's in the Lord. The one place we can always find joy, the one place we can always find it is in the Lord. Philippians 4.4 4 says this, rejoice in the Lord Always. What? Rejoice in the Lord what? Always. How often? I thought he said always be happy. He's saying it again. Rejoice in the Lord, Lord always. Delight. Take pleasure in him. Again, I will say, God's saying, rejoice. Why is he saying it over? He's saying you make a choice to rejoice and make God your source of joy. Don't make anything else your source of joy because anything else that you make your source of joy will let you down. You guys understand that? Well, if I make more money, oh, really? If that's really the case, why do we have multimillionaires committing suicide? They have everything that we're thinking I need to be happy. And why is it we go to a missionary trip in Africa where kids are naked and they're smiling with the joy of the Lord. How? Because joy is not based on outside condition. It's an internal thing. And I got good news for you. If you've never, I want you to get this. If you've never tasted the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't know what true joy is. I'm not telling you, I'm not giving you be happy. I'm telling you, be happy with the Lord. This is what I'm going to say. Let God come into your life and fill you with his joy, a joy that you can experience from any high or anything or any circumstance or any relationship but your relationship with the Lord. Learn how to be happy with God. So today we're going to have a guest speaker, Will Smith. I'm going to show you. See, if, I, if you knew Will Smith was coming, we would have overflow. Will, come here. No, he's kidding. I was to, he's on video, actually. <laughs> you guys are going to freak out. Oh, my God, Will's here. But I'm going to say, oh, my God, Jesus is here. Come on, let's give God some praise. But, but Will, he discovered something that's a principle for happiness in his marriage. And it's this principle. Take personal responsibility over your own happiness. Will, speak to us, please. So me and Jada was reflecting about love. Tired. I literally said to Jada, 
That's it. I retire. I retire from trying to make you happy. I need you to go make yourself happy and just prove to me that it's even possible. But her happiness was her responsibility and my happiness was my responsibility. And we decided that we were going to find our individual, uh, internal, private, separate joy. And then we were going to present ourselves to the relationship and to each other already happy. Not coming to each other, uh, begging with our empty cups out, uh, demanding that she fill my cups and the cup and demanding that she meet my needs. Is unfair and it's, it's kind of uh, unrealistic and can be destructive to place the responsibility for your happiness on anybody other than yourself. Does that drive it home? No, no longer can you blame someone else for your attitude or your response. So, so point number one, take responsibility over your own happiness. How do you start developing a habit of happiness? Number two, decide to be happy and declare it. You decide. And the time to decide to be happy is today. Don't wait for your circumstances to change. I want to become a happy person. If that's possible, God help me. And Psalms 118.24 says this. This is the day. This is David speaking, the one that killed Goliath. He's a warrior. He's a king. And he says, this is the day of the Lord's victory. And another version that says this. This is the day that the Lord has made. What he's doing is defining his day. What he's saying is this is a day of breakthrough. This is a day of victory. This is a day of healing. This is a day of new beginnings. I'm defining this day. This is the day of the Lord's victory. Let us be happy. Let us be happy and let us ce celebrate. What David was saying here, I'm making up my mind right now to be a happy person. Scripture says, this is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. He said, I'm making a choice and I've learned this. If you start making a choice to be happy, opportunities will present themselves because they're already there. Bad attitudes blind us to the victories that are right before us. Bad attitudes blind us to the opportunities. Blind, bad attitudes blind us from the good that's all around us. Right now, there's a victory waiting for you today. There is no day that God doesn't make that doesn't have blessing in it. Why is it there's so many days we're not experiencing blessing? A big part of it, we've not made up our minds to first of all just be happy and begin to celebrate first the things that we do have and then acknowledge that God has made this day and I'm going to discover every pleasure, every, come on, every treasure, every blessing, come on, every breakthrough, every healing, every opportunity that's in it because God does not make empty days. We have empty days and empty lives because we have empty or destructive thinking. So I'm going to say decide. This is the bottom line. Happy couples and happy people decide to be happy. That's it. Number three, how do I develop a habit of happiness? Choose to respond positively to difficult situations and people. Now, I can't always choose what happens to me, and I can't always choose how people treat me, but I can choose my response. You can't make me angry. You could try. I'd have to give, a, I'd have to give in. I'd have to give in to your attitude for me to go and be angry. That's my, that's my choice. But I, I could also choose. I could choose to be happy with difficult people and difficult situations. So I'm going to just, re, just reemphasize this. We can choose to be happy in difficult situations. James 1, 2 says this, my brothers and sisters, you will have many kinds of troubles. You know what it's saying is? You will go through some difficult times. So as a believer, don't be surprised. Oh, my gosh, where are you? He goes, I'm here. I'm the same guy that was there in your good times. 
on your peaks, in your mountains. I'm there in your valleys. It doesn't matter. You're going to go through tough times. You're not in heaven. You're on earth with real devils, real issues, real sicknesses, real problems, and Christians are guaranteed to go through them as well. You will have many kinds of troubles, but when these things happen, you should be very happy. You know why it's saying that? Why should you be happy? Because you grow through trials. The process of a trial begins to show and reveal the areas of weaknesses. And if we deal with them, we become new people. We grow. We become more responsible through a trial. So God says, don't you freak out about a trial because after a trial comes a promotion. You get a test and then you graduate. So thank God for a test. The test is not meant to break you. The test is meant to develop you. The test is meant to promote you. So when you're going through a test, all it does is make you qualified for your next level. Don't, don't fall apart under the test. Grow through the test. I'm going to choose to be happy because this test is proof proof that there is a graduation, a next level in my future. How many get that? A test. You don't become a lawyer without a test. You don't become a doctor without a test. You don't become an insurance agent without a test. If you want to go to another level, you got to take a test. So get excited about the test because your next test qualifies you for greater opportunities. Give the Lord a hand for a test. Give him, give him some praise for a test. So we must refuse to let circumstance determine our mood in our marriages. We must refuse to let circumstances determine our mood in our marriages. We will have all kinds of troubles, but we don't need to let the trouble influence our attitude. Another statement I'm going to make. Our circumstances change like the wind, but our attitudes shouldn't. So we can choose under difficult circumstances to have a good attitude. And if you learn how to respond with a good attitude under difficult circumstances, this is what's going to happen. You'll always grow to another level. Number two, I want to make this other statement. We can choose to be happy even when, with difficult people. Now, you know what that means? You could choose to be happy with a difficult spouse. I got a difficult spouse. You could choose to be happy. Remember, we can't always choose how people treat us. But we can choose our response. Look at Matthew 5, 11 says this. God blesses you when people what? Mock you. Persecute you. Lie about you. Say all sorts of evil things against you. Oh, Lord. God blesses you when people mock you, persecute you, lie about you, and say all kinds of evil things against you. He goes, when people are doing this, I'm ready to bless you. Sometimes the enemy will come. I want you to get this. Stop reflecting the attitude of the people coming against you and start reflecting the attitude of the Lord that you're serving. He goes, if you could continue to reflect my attitude and not take on their hate, not take on their anger, and stay in the spirit. Look what it says here. Verse 12. Be happy about it. Be what? Be very glad. Be happy about what? When they persecute you, when they lie about you, when they talk about you, when they say all sorts of evil things about you, start getting excited for a great reward awaits you. What God is saying, reward time is coming if you could learn how to keep control of your own response. How many get this? Well, why are you angry? Well, they're talking about me. Why'd you go off on that employee at work? She'd been lying about me. And, and God says, man, you just missed your next level. I was setting you up for a breakthrough. But you two reflected her spirit instead of my spirit. You know who you're talking? Do you know, do you know who you're talking about? Do you, I heard you lying. And I'm going to address that. Maybe no one, everybody else is scared about, scared of you. I'm not scared of you. I got the Holy Ghost. 
Why don't we go talk up back while you're taking out your pin in your hair? This is what I've learned. Some of, you, some of us cannot get the next level because you're too busy defending yourself. If God says, would you allow me to defend you? Would you allow me to promote you? Why don't you just keep your mouth shut and let me do the work? I will, see, I'll prepare a table in front of your enemies. I will show them you talked about them, but you couldn't stop their promotion. You couldn't stop their breakthrough. You, you, you persecuted them, but my plan will still prevail. You got to learn that. Even with your husband and wife. And the last thing I want to say. How do we develop a, a, a habit of happiness? Number four, stop blaming and accusing our spouse. It's your fault that I'm not happy. Really? It's your fault that I'm angry. I'm failing. I'm an alcoholic. I'm abusive. I'm not serving God. What? Huh? It's my fault you're crazy? It's my fault you're cuckoo. It's my fault that you're making all these bad decisions. It's my fault you got drunk and crashed the car and now we don't have a car. It's my fault. Really? It's my fault that you blow up, you just fly off the handle. It's my fault. Why, what happened before we got married? You still were blown off the handle. Whose fault was it then? My mama's? Your mama's? Your dad's? Ooh, praise the Lord. We got a lot to work on this today. You know what blame is? Holding someone else responsible for. And, and this is a problem. As long as you're holding someone else responsible for, this is a problem. You're not working on the right side of the ledger. The only place that you're going to find change is within yourself. Stop trying. I'll guarantee you this. You'll never find happiness in marriage trying to fix your spouse. You'll only find happiness in marriage when you allow God to fix you. You know what's so great? I could be happy anywhere. I could be happy here. I could be happy in Hawaii. Praise the Lord. Someone hear that. I want to go to Hawaii. But I'll be happy over there. I could be happy in the dumps. I could be happy, come on, in the palace. It don't matter where you put me because my circumstance does not determine my happiness. I could be happy with you and I could be happy without you. I love my wife and I'm happy with her. But if something happened, I could be happy without her. And that's what she likes about me. And I know she could be happy without me too. She told me once, if I, anything ever happens to me, she's not even going to get married again. Pray, I, go pray. I can't make you that promise. But I like that idea. I like that idea, honey. I like, no, I, okay, I like that idea. All right, I'm getting myself in trouble. But this is why we're learning, honey, so we could cover this stuff. Grace, love, forgiveness is what we're talking about. No resentment. I love you, honey. All right. Okay. So I'm going to give you, what, how does blame sabotage your marriage? And I'm going to go real quick on this. Blame, blame, that's all it does. Blame only starts crazy cycles of blame. You blame me, I become defensive, I blame you. You always do this. How do you know you're blaming someone? It starts with a you statement. How do you know you're blaming someone if followed by the always statement and you never statement? You always and you never. Have you ever said, as soon as you start saying always and never, first of all, you're lying because nobody always and never does anything. You guys understand that? That's a blame statement is what you're creating right now. Stop it. So a blame statements usually start with the word you followed by always and never. Matthew 7, 1 says, do not judge others or you will, be, you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging others is the standard, is the standard by which you will be judged. He's saying, will, will, will. It'll come back. Number two, how we sabotage our marriage through blame. A continual assault of blame can destroy our spouse's self-esteem. They may start to believe that they can't do anything right that they are the cause of all the marital unhappiness and problems. And the truth is, it's not. We should use our words to build our spouses, never tear them down. Ephesians 4.29 says, do not use harmful words, but only 
helpful words, the kind that build up and provide what is needed so that what you say will do good to those who hear them. You use the word to build, never use the wor a word to destroy. And the last thing, blame blinds us from seeing the areas we need to improve in. As long as we are blaming, we are walking, we are walking on the wrong side of the ledger. We're working on the wrong side of the ledger. Matthew 7, 7, 3 says this. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? What he's saying is you could focus on somebody else for the rest of your life. But God's saying you got so much work on your side of the ledger. Why don't you just focus on, focus on what areas you need to improve in and get the right spirit about it. Because understand this, while we're pointing a finger at somebody else, understand we got issues too. But the problem is I can't fix her. And if I'm fo fo focusing on my wife, I got, I'm not allowing God to fix me. And God says, let's do this. Stop the blame game and start allowing me to fix the log that's coming out of your mug. You got a big log coming out of your own mug. And you're worrying about a speck in your brother's eye. Stop trying to fix them. I'll fix them if you'll let me fix you. Come on, let's give God some praise. I'll fix them if you allow me to fix you. If you learned something, just give God some quick praise. Pastor Robert, can you close Thank us out? Thank you for tuning in to this week's sermon. Will you allow me to pray with you? Dear Jesus, I just thank you for my friend on the other side of this camera. I ask you, God, that you would just continue to speak your love into their life. I thank you, God, that you have such an amazing plan and purpose for their life, and you're using this word and many other to speak that into them today. So I ask you, God, to just continue to open up their heart and their mind to your vision and your plan for their life. All right, friends, so thank you so much once again for tuning in to this week's sermon. We believe that God's word makes a major impact in your life. And if you want to make an impact in someone else's life, won't you head on over to thewayworldoutreach.org slash donate today. And in the meantime, we'll see you on next week's sermon.